welcome everybody. I'm Annie Murphy and I'm the director here. Can I just have a show of hands of how many of you are members of the Framingham History? Yes, okay. Um, this program, I am so excited about it. It was, um, let's see, I think Peter Sellers and I, about four years ago, were in the back in the Civil War exhibit area talking about Harmony Grove and we, Peter started telling me about the aqueduct that goes through Pump Farm Pond and he just started talking and I was like, ooh, this guy would be great for a program. <laughs> and um, he's a very busy guy because he's the head of the Framingham DPW. But then when one of our members, Chris Fitz, called me, that was like two years ago, and he said, you know, um, I took some photographs of some stone walls that were um, uh, revealed when the uh, MWRA or, or DCR or whoever they are now uh, lowered the water in the reservoirs. They were trying to kill off the milfoil and during the winter time. So they lowered the um, water so all of these stone walls were exposed. And he said, and he, you will see one of his photos and Fred can tell you more about that. But I was thinking, okay, so here we have our own Swift River um, in that there must have been a lot of land taking and a lot of stone walls for where people used to live and who were these people? And um, so Chris and um, sent me some more photos and um, I guess Ruth Ann's gonna tell you a little bit more about how this all evolved. But I love rivers, I love reservoirs, I love water, I feel a little bit of lemming-ish. Um, and so this is just exciting. And I just have to say that um, when you have an idea around here, it's so exciting because not only do we have the archives, but we have the people among us who are willing to put the research and the hard work into creating the program that you're going to see today. So I just want to give a major shout out to Fred Wallace, our town historian. Um, and um, I also did, do we have Karen Graham in the room? Oh, hi, Karen. <laughs> she just came in. Great. Karen is the uh, MWRA librarian. Um, we also had help from Sean Fisher, who was the archivist at the DCR, and his title also includes the Office of Cultural Resources, and a woman named Lisa Grohlman, Real Property Project Manager at the MWRA. And Karen, thank you so much, because these guys connected us to some fabulous archives and um, really helped us pull this all together. And of course, Peter Sellers, who is here in the audience, um, thank you. And Joe Duggan. Joe is, um, he's a member, he's a third grade docent and a very active member of the Waterworks Museum in Brookline and he has a history of, of um, working, his profession is, was in the Waterworks. So I will, um, I want to introduce Ruth Ann Thomasett and uh, Thomasini, oh there's Thomasettis and Thomasinis in the room and I get always confused. <laughs> so Ruth Ann, come say a few words. Well, first I want to thank Annie, because when she said this would be a great program, I wasn't sure I was going to buy it. Um, building bridges, aqueducts, I wasn't sure. But then to start getting into the program and looking at the pictures and the extraordinary construction that went on and the people that were affected by it, the properties that were lost, um, the litigation that took place. This all evolved into a, a great deal of interest to me. So I, I kind of built from there. And then Fred, my educator, he was the one that told me about the waterworks. He did the research. Mine was people, places, things, strictly. Um, so thank you, Annie. I'm glad that came up. I'm glad we pursued it. I can see the interest is there. You were right. <laughs> I knew you would be. Um, I also would like to thank Sean Fisher, who sent us this wonderful link to the digital Commonwealth, Commonwealth Digital Collection. 
I would recommend, I think we're going to put it on our website. Um, if you like some of the pictures you're seeing today, wait until you see them. Uh, there's a lot out there. Uh, they're extraordinary. Uh, the underground work, the horses pulling seven and a half feet, iron pipes, stainless steel. It, it's just amazing. So definitely take a look. Uh, I think you'll find it very interesting. I also want to mention the History Center and how things evolve here. Um, you know, you go to look for one thing and you're led to something else. And in doing this, as early as last Thursday, a couple of days ago, um, Kathy Tomasetti, who's come up from um, the Cape, said to us something that Fred will talk about. Um, in a box we found on Thursday, there were letters of the litigation and the payments from the Josiah Temple collection that we found just Thursday. And so it's, it's amazing. There was another etching that we found from Thomas Wharton, who was an artist that we've researched here. He came uh, from the South, came up to Saxonville for a restoration of his health and did a lot of etches of the area, one of which is the Wayland Waterworks. So, constituent Waterworks, I should say. So, anyway, thank you all. Thank you, Fred, for educating me. And enjoy the wonderful program. Well, thank you very much, Ruth Ann, for your kind words. I think you uh, underestimate your own contributions to this thing. You're an amazing researcher. Uh, you, you get on that internet and you can find things that nobody else can find. And you have been a great help throughout this process. I'd like to begin with a couple of acknowledgments myself. Um, I, again, I, I, mean, I, was, I'm a, I mentioned Ruth, uh, Ruth Ann Tomasini. I want to mention Laura Stagliola, who is our education coordinator here, who was a great help to me in putting together the, uh, the visual uh, program that you're going to see here today. And uh, we have a special guest, Kathy Tomasetti, uh, whom Ruth Ann mentioned, and uh, she's got a fascinating story to tell about uh, the uh, the uh, dam at Winter Street that we'll, uh, when we get to that point, I'll ask her to say a couple of words. Um, so let's get going. We've got a lot to cover today. Uh, we're going today to talk about uh, things that happened between 1840 and 1940. And uh, we plan to have a follow-up program to cover the period from 1940 to the present. Uh, we thought uh, that there's a good cutoff point at, in 1940 that I'll talk about. So let's begin. Annie mentioned uh, the Foss Reservoir being drained a few years ago, and one of our members noticed this and saw the stone walls that emerged. And this is a picture of the, the drained reservoir, the Foss Reservoir, and one of the stone walls that appeared when, this, when the reservoir was drained. And uh, that was one of the inspirations to do a program like this. We begin with a uh, puzzle. Why should a community such as Framingham, blessed with an abundant natural water resources, find itself with insufficient water supply in 1900? After all, the town has two large rivers, the Sudbury and Stony Brook, uh, several ponds, including Farm Pond, Lake Washakum, uh, Larned's Pond, and uh, Gleason's Pond, and a large subterranean aquifer that we will talk about a little later on. So the really is no reason why the town should not have adequate water supply. The reason for that is Boston. <laughs> Boston. By the 1840s, the city of Boston was growing very rapidly, uh, due in part to the Irish uh, immigration that was going on at that time. And uh, it was outgrowing its water supply. So in 1846, the state legislature authorized the city to obtain water supply from Long Pond, which is the body of water that we know of today as Lake Kachichuit, and to construct an, to construct an aqueduct uh, to carry the water to the city. Now, the project was completed in, 1940, in 1848, 
Uh, and uh, there was a huge celebration in Boston when this happened. 100,000 people showed up on Boston Common to celebrate the occasion. Invitations went out to people throughout uh, the eastern uh, part of the state. And here we see one of those invitations. It's difficult to read, so let me uh, tell you what it says. October 5th, 1848, Sir, the city government intends to celebrate the introduction of pure water from Lake Kachichuit into the city on the 25th of October at a public, by a public, <coughs> public procession and other ceremonies suited to the occasion. You are respectfully invited to join us in the same. And it's signed by Josiah Quincy and others who were the invitation committee. Now this particular invitation that we have here in our collection is addressed to a young man who had just recently graduated from West Point uh, about two years earlier and was home recovering from wounds that he had received in the uh, Mexican War. That was uh, a young lieutenant, Lieutenant George H. Gordon. Oh, I should, I should mention on the right is a uh, it was a, uh, a little badge or medallion that was given to everybody who attended the ceremonies. And it shows the fountain that was in, in the frog pond in, in Boston Common. We have in our collection a piece of sheet music, which is called the Kachichuit Grand Quickstep, <laughs> apparently written for the occasion. Uh, it shows the fountain in the frog pond on Boston Common, 1848, and some spectators standing. Now, um, as a result of, of this uh, action that they took, um, Kachichuit Brook, which flows out of uh, Kich Lake Kachichuit and down into the Sudbury River in the Saxonville area, was dammed up to uh, stop the flow. They wanted to conserve that water so they could go to Boston. And a couple of small textile mills along the brook had to be shut down, and of course there was loss of jobs at the time. So here we see one of the dams. This is a more recent dam. The original dam was built of wood, and unfortunately we don't have an image of that. Um, but Boston's population continued to grow over the next uh, 20 years or so, and it reached 200,000 in 1870. So the, the demand for more water continued relentlessly uh, throughout, <coughs> throughout those 20 years. Now, in 1871, there was a catastrophic event in the city of Boston. There was the Great Fire of, of 1872 in Boston. Uh, it was, the, uh, at the time, the worst fire in U.S. history up to that time. It was worse than the Chicago Fire that had happened a year earlier. It, it got much less publicity because there was less loss of life. But 776 buildings were destroyed in this fire. And this particular panoramic photo was taken from the corner of Washington Street and Bromfield Street. One of the reasons that the fire was so bad was the lack of adequate fire hydrants throughout the city. And we have to remember that public water supply is important not only for domestic use, but one of the major reasons for public water supply is fire suppression. 1873, a critical event. The legislature authorized the city of Boston to develop new water sources called the Sudbury Water System, which would include parts of the Sudbury River, parts of Stony Brook, Farm Pond, and so on. Uh, construction would stretch out over seven years under the supervision of a man named Desmond Fitzgerald, who was a prominent engineer at that time. And of course, uh, this project created many, many jobs and was probably responsible for some of the uh, sudden growth of South Framingham at this time. And among the skills that were needed were bricklayers and stone cutters, and Italian workers having, uh, having a reputation in bricklaying and stonework uh, probably were attracted to the city at this time. So here we see uh, a map of the area, and I'll try to point some things out to you. This is the course of the, uh, the Sudbury River, it's coming into town from Ashland, flowing up this way. Uh, it makes a turn here. And this is Stony Brook that flows into, into the Sudbury River this way. And then the, the Sudbury continues up, going northeast through the town, into the Saxonville area, and on into Sudbury. You can also see here Lake Kachichuit. And one of the features that 
<clears throat> I want to point out, which is a very important part of the system, is Farm Pond, which is right here. And you can see uh, Union Avenue probably going up in between there. You can see the railroad tracks along the east shore of the of Farm Pond and uh, Waverly Street running this way. So when the system was built, there were three reservoirs. You would think that since the flow is in this direction, they would be numbered one, two, and three. <clears throat> but this is government work. <laughs> so they're numbered one, two, and three. Uh, th this is the basin three that you see when you drive on Route 9 going west. And uh, there are three dams. There's a dam right here. There's a dam here. And there's another dam down here. I mentioned that Farm Pond plays a significant role in the whole system, so I just want to point out some detail here. So you see Farm Pond, north is up here. It had a natural outflow which uh, went out of the north end of the pond and into the Sudbury River. You see the Sudbury River up here. If you want to orient yourself, the uh, Mount Wade area is right here. Uh, Waverly Street would be down here. You can see Union Avenue here and railroad tracks which ran right along the eastern shore of the lake and went off into the northwest. Uh, other things that are important in this map that I want to point out here is Beaver Dam Brook, which actually is the outflow from Lake Washakam down here. Uh, that'll come up later. And down here um, you see a line which represents what became the Sudbury Aqueduct. That was the, the aqueduct that carried this water into Boston. Here we see the three dams. Now the dam on the left is probably, you all probably recognize it, it's the dam at Winter Street. Many of us drive by that many a time a week. And Kathy, this is where your great-great-grandfather worked? Is that great-grandfather? You want to just say up and say a couple of words about that? My great-grandparents <coughs> Ireland, settled in Boston, and moved to Framingham in the mid-1880s, and um, in the uh, mid-1890s, with their two sons that they had, and then they had two more later. And my mother said that my great-grandfather used to walk from their house on the corner of Pine and Hay Street, down near Memorial School area, to the dam every day and adjust the water flow, no matter what the weather was. So he worked for 44 years for the um, Massachusetts Waterworks. That's a great story. So, um, I think it was about 2003, it was before I retired because I used to drive by it every day. They took it all apart and they remodeled it. So I used to think of them every day, they're thinking how excited he would be to see that they would remodel the whole building. It was really beautifully done with copper and everything around it. But um, she used to say when we drive by, Grandpa worked there, Grandpa worked there all the time. <laughs> That's, that's all I know. That's good. Well, thank you for that. Yeah, it's very interesting to have that personal input there. Now, the dam on the right is uh, down uh, uh, close to the Ashland town line. And it's one that's rather difficult to see from any main road. We usually don't see that. Um, if you were uh, driving on Winter Street and you could go through the neighborhoods uh, on the right and down the hill you would see it there, but we usually aren't able to see that. And this is the more familiar one. This is the dam on Basin 3 that you see on Route 9 as you're driving west. So how did the system work? Well, uh, water flowed from Basin 3 through a conduit and into Farm Pond. And Farm Pond, I believe, acted as a sort of holding area for water. And for that reason, it was dammed up. That's why there was a dam. I think I have a slide to show that. Uh, <clears throat> and then there was a gatehouse on the south side of Farm Pond, which controlled the flow of water out of, out of the pond and into the aqueduct and to Boston. And uh, the, the way the original uh, law authorizing these, this construction was written up, Frank Framingham had rights to this water. Here's the outlet. Now, the, the, the map has been turned on its side here, so north is over here. This is the outlet that I pointed out previously, and you can see that that was dammed up. 
This is a cross section of how the land the dam was built. Um, this is the conduit that comes into the pond from Basin 3. And over here, you see the uh, beginning of the aqueduct that went into Boston. And there's a little kind of dark spot there. I don't know if you can see it. I can barely see it from here. But uh, that is the gatehouse on the south end of Farm Pond, which is still standing there today. And by the way, this aqueduct continued in use until 1974. Amazing, I think. Uh, this little building has been subjected to some vandalism, so there's a fence around it now. I think it's under the control of the DCR. And this uh, red line show, shows the, uh, the route from Farm Pond here down through Natick, through Wellesley, through Newton, just missing Brookline and ending up in the Chestnut Hill Reservoir. Can you imagine building an aqueduct like that by all manual labor? It must have been an incredible task. And this is what it looked like in, inside that uh, aqueduct when people were actually constructing it. It's all brickwork, tall enough for a man to stand up in, um, and over 15 miles, I think. An, an amazing feat. If you go down to the south side, you can see that uh, running through the neighborhoods. And if you go to the intersection of Tripp Street and uh, Irving and look east and west, this is a view to the east and this is a view to the west. There's even a little gatehouse down there uh, where it crosses Leland Street. So that uh, <clears throat> is the uh, story of how the uh, aqueduct was constructed. This whole project had an, an, quite an impact on our town. Over a thousand acres of prime farmland were purchased or taken by eminent domain and flooded. 71 landowners were affected. And again, Framingham was promised rights to, the, to water in the basin number three <clears throat> and farm pond. These are what I call the 10 big losers. These are the people who lost the most land. Um, and there are a lot of uh, recognizable names there. Uh, we'll start with uh, David Nevins, Nevins Hall in the Memorial Building. Mr. Nevins and his family contributed the funds for the construction of Nevins Hall. Samuel Byrd was a state legislator, a very successful businessman in town here and a selectman. He lost over 50 acres. We all know the, the Merriam name very well, very active in town affairs for over 100 years. William G. Lewis um, owned property down on Salem End Road, lost quite a bit. Uh, Ruth Ann, did you tell me that he was one of the litigators who did not accept his original offer from the state? Yes. He went to court and he, yes. do you know, did he get a better settlement? <laughs> um, we just found this on, I uh, mentioned the, the letters that we found, and uh, I think he had one of the largest settlements. Okay. Who else? John Johnson was a farmer. He had a very large farm up on Pleasant Street, uh, towards uh, the western end of Pleasant Street, where the Brophy School is today. And one interesting fact about Mr. Johnson, the stone that the Academy Building is constructed from was, uh, was quarried on his property. Uh, Josiah Temple, we all know who Josiah is, and the Bullard name is a familiar Framingham name. So these were the people who lost the most land. These are the homes of some of the people who lost the most land. And as you might expect, those who owned the most land had very nice houses. Uh, Moses Ellis, you probably recognize that, that's where the Montessori School is on Pleasant Street. This uh, is the David Nevins home on Winter Street. It's uh, where the Carlisle Nursing Home is today. It's just beside it. And uh, I'm on the Historical Commission and I'm hoping that some good things are gonna happen to that building in the next two or three years. Uh, this is uh, where William G. Lewis home was. It was called Lawn Farm. And uh, he was the one who got the good settlement from the state for his land. And this is the home of Samuel Byrd, another one of those people who lost quite a bit of land. Around 1880, Framingham began to recognize its own needs for water. By now, uh, South Framingham 
was a fast-growing urban area. Most of Framingham was still rural agricultural farmland, the exception being the Saxonville area, of course. But by now, South Framingham was really a, a small city or, or a large town, take your pick. And uh, in 1880, the town hired a civil engineer named L. Frederick Rice to make a study and make recommendations as to how they should uh, to proceed to uh, ensure the suffi sufficient water supply for the future. And he came up with a brilliant recommendation, let's use Farm Pond. So uh, in 1881, the legislature uh, authorized the town to develop its own water supply, including water from the Sudbury River, and uh, to construct pumping facilities. Um, in 1882, after, uh, after much deliberation, the town decided to have a privatized water supply system. The town meeting made that decision. And unfortunately, that had unintended consequences, not of a good kind. They, they would regret that decision. In 1883, a private company was formed, the Framingham Water Company. Uh, it was established, and uh, it built a pumping station on the eastern shore of Farm Pond. And purification was by a system called filter galleries. Now, I'm no expert on water works, but maybe, Joe, can you just mention a, some, briefly what the filter gallery would, be, would have been? Yeah, that's very similar to Wellesley's first supply of water. In, in other words, you uh, dig down near where your source is, and here'd be Farm Pond, and then allow water to percolate through the sand and gravel into the gallery and pump out of that. Okay, thank you, Joe. And we do not have a photograph of that first uh, pumping station, but we did find in our archives a map. At this, at this time, Framingham joined with other towns in the area uh, over in Natick, around uh, Lake Kachichuit, uh, uh trying to recover pilot payments, payments in lieu of taxes, uh, for the land, the large amount of land that was taken off of the tax rolls. So there began to be friction between uh, the, the town and the Boston Water Board at this point. Okay, here we see that uh, map that I mentioned that uh, shows the, uh, the waterworks. Uh, just on the edge of the, of the picture here, you see blue, which is Lake uh, Farm Pond. And you can see by the contours of it, if you look at one of the maps of Farm Pond, this is over on the eastern shore. There's the, uh, the pumping station. And you see the railroad tracks. There was actually one, two, three, four, five tracks that went past it very close to it. And this dotted line represents the pipe that went out into the neighborhood at Linden Street off of Franklin. People know where Linden Street is? And so from there, the water was dispersed throughout South Framingham. So that would have been right over here. If you notice the contour of the shore, it kind of matches up with this contour that you see here. In 1883, the Boston Water Board determined that the quality of the water in Farm Pond was not up to snuff, and they decided that they were going to bypass Farm Pond. Now, what was wrong with the water in Farm Pond? I'm not sure. It was said to be had a lot of silt in it, and of course the trains were going by there every day, and uh, they were drawing water for their steam engines, and they were probably spewing out sparks and, and dust and so forth. Um, and there's a whole story around the interaction between the railroad companies and uh, Framingham and its water supply, and I'm not going to try to go into that today. But uh, what I what I think happened is that the aqueduct, which originally was to start over here, got extended back through the pond along this shore and it linked up with the conduit that was coming from Basin 3. Now that may have been part of the original plan, it may not, but in any case, the mixing of water of Farm Pond and water from the conduit uh, stopped at this time. And of course, uh, the town uh, didn't like that because it meant that Framingham was more or less reliable, uh, uh, reliant on the available water in Farm Pond. And relations between the town and the Boston Water Board. 
became very dicey at this point, and I think it continued to be that way for quite some time. To illustrate the point, I have a quote from a town report uh, dated 1884. By special legislative enactments in favor of Boston, that gigantic corporation has levied tribute on the waters of Mystic Valley, Sudbury Valley, Farm Pond, and Lake Chichewit, and all streams tributary to those waters. The inhabitants of all towns bordering on these rivers, ponds, and streams have been mercilessly robbed of their prescriptive rights and now demand redress. Undoubtedly, the wisdom of future legislatures will remedy this evil. If not, the towns will certainly establish the fact that they do have rights that cities must respect. How's that for a slam? In 1885, the water company was up and running in town, and by 1890, there were 13 miles of water pipe throughout South Framingham. And they went to homes, businesses, and there were 85 fire hydrants throughout the South Framingham at that time. Um, now, unintended consequences. People have a lot of water. They have water in their homes. They're washing dishes. They're flushing toilets. And it creates a new problem called sewage. <laughs> um, what happened to all that sewage? Well, from what I can tell, it was going into, uh, into drains and uh, eventually found its way into Beaver Dam Brook. And it flowed into Lake Cachichua. I found one report uh, from town records that said that up to 50,000 gallons of raw sewage per day was going into Lake Cachichua from Framingham. So Boston filed suit against Boston to, to stop this. Of course they would. In 1887, the legislature granted authority to the town of Framingham to develop its own sewage system, provided that the discharge would be outside of the Sudbury River watershed. Well, we're right in the middle of that watershed, so that was going to be a chore. In 1888, the town bought a 70-acre site in Natick, north of Route 9, and began construction on a sewer system. A pumping station was built on Waverly Street in the downtown so that they could pump the sewage up to this 70-acre site in Natick. How about that? <laughs> and, you know, the sewage beds that were created at that time were still in operation up to about 1950. We don't have a photograph of that first pumping station, but I did find an artist's sketch in our collections. It's a nice, imposing building. And uh, I have a photograph of the sewage beds. <laughs> That's right. The sewage beds were right near the uh, intersection of Speen Street and Route 9. And uh, for many years, that's where we disposed of our sewage. Today, it's where you go shopping. <laughs> Strange, stranger things have happened. In 1889, the town tried unsuccessfully to buy out the water company, realizing that it was probably a mistake in the beginning, and to convert to a publicly owned system. Now, there was a clause in the original agreement between the water company and the town that said that the town could buy them out at any time at a mutually agreeable price. Of course, the uh, water company had the town over a barrel and they knew it. So they held out for a, a handsome price and the town said no. Efforts to convert to a public water supply. In 1889, the town decided to find out just exactly what its rights were. They uh, obtained a legal opinion that they had surrendered all of its rights to develop water supply to the water company. Unintended consequences. Negotiations to change that would stretch out over 15 years. Meanwhile, uh, by 1893, the sewage system had been developed to quite an extent and extended out throughout South Framingham. In 1895, the State Board of Health published a study that they had been working on for quite a few years, uh, projecting water needs for Boston and the surrounding communities for the next 35 years. You know, I don't understand why they didn't develop a plan for the next 100 years. So it seems to me 35 isn't very long, but I guess in 1895 that seemed like a long time to them. 
Um, that plan had three basic recommendations. First, the formation of a metropolitan water district encompassing Boston, encompassing Boston and 11 surrounding communities. Framingham was not included. Second, formation of a metropolitan water board. Third, construction of another reservoir, which would become the Wachusett Reservoir, uh, to supplement the uh, water needs of Boston and surrounding cities. And the legislature adopted all of the recommendations in that plan. The water board selected two civil engineers to oversee the projects that were looming ahead, Fred Stearns and Dexter Brackett. Now you probably know that one of the reservoirs is Brackett Reservoir and another is Dexter, uh, is uh, Stearns Reservoir. So now you know why they're called that. So between 1895 and 1898, the Fayville Dam was built on Upper Stony Brook in Southborough, just, just across the line. If you look at your map, where you, where you see that large reservoir where Basin 3 was, just across the line into Southborough is where that Fayville Dam was built. And it is an imposing structure if you haven't seen it. Just drive out Pleasant Street and just after you cross the Southborough line, look off to your right and you'll see a massive dam there. In 1897, construction was begun on the Wachusett Reservoir and the plan was for that to feed water into the Fayville Dam Reservoir and uh, eventually to connect with in what in 1901 was begun, that was the work on the Western Aqueduct, another aqueduct through Framingham. Uh, again, more land taking, and again, lots of jobs. Uh, this shows the route of the uh, Western Aqueduct. It comes into town here down near Waveney Road, crosses Millwood, Grove Street, Edgell Road, up into the Knobscot area, past the, uh, past the uh, Hemingway School uh, and the McAuliffe Library and on into Saxonville. And in, in some places it was uh, laid above ground or near above ground. In other places it had to be tunneled. And the next few slides, as I go through them, Ruth Ann, if you want to comment, please feel free to do so. Uh, this is, shows one of the methods of construction where it was possible, they could just dig a trench and lay pipe in the trench and cover it up with earth. This was all done by manual labor. It just, um, you know, it staggers my mind when I think of it. But what did you have? No Mack trucks. What you had was horse and wagon and men with shovels. They would, they would dig this enormous trench and then off in the distance there, you can see where the pipe has been laid and partially covered up. In areas where they had to tunnel, this was what the project consisted of. Imagine doing that. I suppose there was a blasting that was necessary for that sort of thing. This shows one section. Now, we're no longer using brick for these things now. We're into the age of iron and steel. This is a, uh, a piece of pipe, seven and a half foot diameter. Is that right, Ruth Ann? Team of, eight. Team of eight horses pulling that into place in one of those trenches. And these pictures, this is just a small sample of the pictures that are on that digital, digital Commonwealth website if you're interested. There were, uh, uh, I, t I suppose, itinerant workers that came here to work on this, and they set up camps throughout the neighborhoods where the, the aqueduct was going. And this camp was on it says Perkins property, I believe, which would be near Millwood Street. Right. Uh, the Perkins own a large, large land holdings in that area there. I think we determined it was in the area of uh, Owl's Nest. Yes, near the, the where the Owl's Nest. Yes, and this camp is quite different from another camp that we're going to show you a picture of. I can zoom in a little bit, I think. You can see potbelly stoves here. The, uh, the huts that the, they're staying in are fairly substantial. I mean, at least they look like permanent buildings or semi-permanent buildings. And then there were other camps. This camp was called what, Ruth Ann? This was the Italian camp. The Italian camp. And, uh, I don't know why, whether it was because of communications or because the bricklayers were there. Maybe, um, maybe the Italian workers wanted to live together. Yeah. 
Uh, but if you notice, Fred, if you yeah, zero in a little bit, it's kind of interesting to see the saw is holding a lot of these together. They're loose with the saw. They're, they're literally saw at side huts. And even the sides of them, they're, they're basically lean to the saw uh, that they were living in. So it was quite a discrepancy. Yes, yeah, so we'll start out closest to uh, the dam, the Fayville Dam, and, and look at some of the properties that the uh, Western Aqueduct went through. One property was the Capon property that is down near the intersection of Belknap and Pleasant Street. Um, I believe this building, whoops, I believe this building is still standing. There is a Capon house down there on Belknap. And here, what do we have in this photograph, Ruth Ann? Surveyors? Surveyors. If you look at, at uh, the back, yeah. See on the left hand side. You see work, workmen here? So Out in the field? It's pretty interesting to see how surveying was done in 1901. It's a little primitive. Uh, again, this is property on, on probably on uh, Belknap Road. I haven't quite identified where it is. This is where the, the project intersected Millwood Street. This is looking along Pleasant Street in 1901, looking east. Um, so you're looking east, east in this direction here. So the aqueduct would have gone through these fields over here. Isn't it charming to see <laughs> pictures like that? really tickles me. This is the cutting property up in Knobscot. There's always been a cutting family in Knobscot, I think, for, since forever. There's still cuttings in that area. Fred, I think uh, Cora Cutting had one of the largest settlements. Some people would uh, actually sue um, to, for compensation, and she was one of the largest uh, of the uh, people that were rewarded with their funds for, for their Taking a property. I mean, if you think about it, there were dairy farmers. Um, yeah, land. The land was very critical to their livelihood. Yeah, where in Knobscot? Where in Knobscot? Uh, near the junction of uh, Water Street and uh, Potter Road. And I think most of you, if you're if you're at all familiar with Saxonville, you'll recognize this building here, Doctor Weed's house. This was taken over. Uh, and the, uh, the superintendent of this Western Aqueduct project uh, made his headquarters in this building. He probably had his residence there and the offices where the, the uh, professional people worked. And one final view. This is Elm Street, north of the center of Saxonville, in 1901. <laughs> and it does, it does go through that neighborhood. One last picture of the manual labor that went into this thing. Today, of course, the Western Aqueduct is a nice walking trail that you probably, some of you are familiar with. It's a very nice addition to the public lands in our town. This uh, aqueduct has been decommissioned. So, 1905, moving right ahead, the town and the water company finally come to an agreement on the price and the town buys them out. It only took 15 years. However, they weren't happy when they did acquire it. Uh, at the time, there were many complaints coming in about the quality of the water. It didn't taste good, it didn't smell good, and it had a color to it. So when the town acquired the water company, they found that its equipment was in very poor condition. It had not been maintained very well. In fact, at times, they learned that water was being pumped directly from Farm Pond without filtration. <laughs> So, in 1906, uh, the, town is, the town established a water supply committee, and uh, they put a heavy hitter in as chairman of that uh, committee. Henry S. Dennison uh, was chairman of the water committee at that time. And they entered into a long, a, a series of prolonged negotiations with the Metropolitan Water Board to reestablish the town's rights to water from Basin 3, as well as its right to seek new water sources within town boundaries. Now, the, uh, the friction between the two parties was still going on. In 1906, the town filed legislation to require Boston 
to pay 80% of the cost of a sewage disposal system for the Saxonville neighborhood. Imagine that. I mean, you can imagine that the Boston Water Board was not happy. That bill actually passed the legislature, went up to the governor's desk. Mayor Fitzgerald, Honey Fitz, made a trip to the, to the uh, state house. The bill was vetoed. So finally we come to uh, March 1912. After, uh, as a result of that long negotiation that went on, Henry Dennison playing a major role, of course, the legislature passed Chapter 656, giving Framingham the right to make a connection to Basin 3 and to seek new water sources. This is probably when Framingham became a paying customer of the Metropolitan District. Now, over the next few years, um, between 1915 and 1920, the town began drawing water from the reservoir again. And just to illustrate, um, in 1915, it was getting 20% of its water from the reservoir. And by 1919, they were getting over 50% from the reservoir. And, and just the reverse, as far as Farm Pond was concerned. In 1915, 80% 80, 80 of our water was coming from Farm Pond. And by 1919, only 45%. During the decade between 1910 and 1920, the water system was extended through large parts of town, including Knobscott, the Mount Waite area, Pleasant, up Pleasant Street to the South Borough border, and to Lokerville uh, towards Natick. Um, the town's water usage doubled between 1900 and 1920, and that was the, the result of the uh, great growth in population that took place during that time. And in 1919, the legislature created a new body, the Metropolitan District Commission, or MDC, to replace the old Metropolitan Water and Sewage Boards. Uh, this new body would have three divisions, water, sewage, and parks. Now, I grew up in eastern Massachusetts, and as a young boy, I and my friends liked to go swimming in the summertime. And uh, Spot Pond was not far from where we lived. Of course, that was part of the Metropolitan District's water system. So uh, we would, on occasion, go skinny dipping in spot ponds. And we would no sooner get our clothes off and into the water. It seemed like every time we did, an, an MDC cruiser would come around up here in the distance, and we would all go running as fast as we could into the woods. So anyways, that's, that's beside the point. But I thought, I thought it's a good story. By 1920, the filter galleries that uh, was the system of filtration and, and purification of our water, uh, the filter galleries of that old water company system were so badly clogged that they were working at uh, like 10% efficiency. And the town was drawing more and more water from the reservoir. I suppose I should mention that around, around this time, 1918, 1920, the Metropolitan uh, Water district began using chlorination for water purification. By 1927, um, in the sewage, talking now about sewage uh, systems, by 1927, there were three more sewage pumping stations in the town, one in Saxonville, one at the center, and one in Lokerville. I don't know if the one on Waverly Street was still in operation at this time. 1930, another critical event. Um, after, again, negotiating with the MDC this time, an agreement was reached with, uh, the, with them, allowing Framingham to make a connection to the aqueduct at Winter Street and install a high-capacity, three million gallon per day pumping station. You probably all drive by this and never even notice it. It's not a very big building, but it's right across the street from the dam. And uh, this is where we, uh, we're getting our water in, uh, after 1930, or much of our water after 1930. About the same time, the town made a reciprocal agreement with the town of Natick uh, to make a connection between our two public supply systems so that if there were some sort of catastrophic event and one town lost its water supply, they could temporarily link up with the other town. And that probably still exists, doesn't it, Peter? Yes. 
Uh, throughout the 1930s, the town <clears throat> continued to draw water from both the reservoir and farm pond, but increasingly from the reservoir. And uh, the town uh, began doing its own exploration for new underground water sources. During the 1930s, geological studies revealed that beneath the, the northeast corner of the town, there lay the largest aquifer in the state. Now, what is an aquifer? I hope people know what it is, but I think I'll just throw a definition up here. Permeable rock that can contain or transmit water. And uh, there, in fact, is enough water there to take care of the town's needs for many years following, following 1930. And the town drilled wells, uh, the Birch Road wells, drilled wells to tap into that water source. So that should have taken care of the town's water needs for a substantial length of time. But that's part of the, the rest of the story that we will tell in our second presentation. <laughs> there, there's the hook, you'll have to come back. I'll try to explain a little bit about that uh, geological formation, because I think it's an interesting story. What this first thing up here is, you can consider that to be like an aerial photograph of the northeast corner of Framingham. And you can see Lake Kachichua here, Dudley Pond and Whaling back there, the Sudbury River flowing along back here. You can see the outlet, the Kachichua Brook running out of, uh, of uh, Lake Kachichua. And there's a black line across that aerial photograph. You'll see the black line here. Imagine, if you can, that we just slice down through the earth right at that point and just peel away all of the soils and subsoils so that we can look at a cross-section of what's beneath the surface of the earth here. And what you see at the deepest levels is bedrock, uh, hard impermeable rock. But right here in this area, there is a deep cut in that bedrock which was made, we're told, by geologists during the Ice Age when the glaciers were melt melting. Roaring ri a roaring river came down out of New Hampshire and Maine and Canada and cut through this area and just by the sheer force of the water and the rubble that it carried along with it, it cut this deep valley in the granite. And then over the tens of thousands of years since the Ice Age, that has filled in with gravel, sand, um, and compacted soil that eventually forms this um, permeable rock that can hold water. And if you, you line up Lake Kachichua, where the black line crosses it with this spot right here, you can see that this is probably exaggerated here, but there, there's a dip in the soils which represents uh, Lake Kachichua. And over here there's another dip which represents the Sudbury River. So. Here is this huge reservoir of water just waiting to be used. And uh, well, well, we'll save that for the next presentation. But I just thought I'd end by saying that all civilizations have depended on water supply. And uh, nobody was better at doing that than the Romans. Uh, this is an aqueduct that is uh, in Spain near the town of Montserrat. I think the thing is over 100 feet high, and it runs for miles, bringing water from the mountains uh, next to Montserrat uh, to a, an old Roman city uh, further south in Spain. So they were masters at managing water supply. It's truly amazing what they did. All hand construction, of course. So with that, to be continued. I'll try to answer questions. Beth? Beth, will you stand up? Is the Johnson Farm that had some land taking, is that the grocery school? Is that the Red House that's still there, just before the school? Uh, that, what, that house was occupied by Johnsons at one time, yes. It's you know, the house that's in very bad repair. Yeah. Unfortunately, that's going to get knocked down, I'm afraid. A, a developer has bought that property. And, 
we've uh, put a delay on him, but he doesn't seem to want, he doesn't seem to want to work with the historical commission. Um, yes, and also across the street from the uh, Brophy School is another house, a beautiful house, which was restored recently. That is a Johnson home, also. Other questions? Yeah, right here. The uh, original brick arch uh, aqueducts. I assume all of that was just gravity feed all the way into Boston. That original Sudbury aqueduct, the first one, yeah. was a gravity gravity flow all the way. So now they're all piped. The, the Western is a pressure yeah. a pressure aqueduct. Yes. That would take a stretch to go all that way. Yes. The mm -hmm. Yeah, they had to have a gradient all the way. If you haven't been to the, Met the uh, Metropolitan Waterworks Museum over in Chestnut Hill, right near the reservoir, I guess it's a fantastic take. I, through all of this, every week I say, well, this is the week I'm going to go, and I haven't been yet. So, talk about the, uh, the, the uh, Metro Sound, which was the one that very deep you can't really see. And then there's the uh, Haltman, which the Haltman Aqueduct was built in 1939 that Fred had just. Yeah. So the only ones that have made available for walking shows are the ones that are not active. Yes. What was the price tag that the town paid to buy the water from the private water company? I have to top of my head. I oh, don't man. know. <laughs> too, too much is the answer. Okay. <laughs> Uh, do we know who some of the owners were of the water company? I have their names in my records, yes. Right off the top of my head. They were not local people. No. They wouldn't have done that to us. <laughs> <laughs> Joanne? The aqueduct that runs up through Pinefield, the one that's been decommissioned, yes. is built of brick, correct? Uh, that would be the halt, that would be the western. No, that that should be a steel pipe. How is it maintained? I mean, is it <laughs> well, there are, there are periodic. There are there are periodic places where they can enter. Yeah, there are, there are, you'll see little what look like gatehouses, uh, fenced off, and and men can actually get down inside of those. But there there are you know it's miles and miles. It is difficult to maintain them. No no question. What's that? No. Who's responsible for maintenance? Oh, that's the uh, Metropolitan Water System. Yes, question? I'm wondering, did county governments play any role in getting towns and cities? Not at all, as far as I'm aware. No. Yes? So you've got those pictures of the stone walls because they lower the water levels to get rid of some invasive vegetation. Correct. Looks like they did it again recently. Yeah. Yes, they did it this year, partially, I think. So they're doing this every couple of years now? It, it didn't work the first time. The, win the winter wasn't cold enough that year. It didn't kill the invasive uh, vegetation. So, so hopefully, it, this year it is hopefully this year, we've had some pretty cold weather, so hopefully the vegetation has been killed. Yeah. Another question or two? Yeah? Um, I've been doing some research on uh, genealogical things having to do with the. Uh, um, Musterfield, 1900, mm -hmm. and I know there was a big issue of the quality of the water for the troops. Do you know where that came from? Was it from this? It would have been from Farm Pond at that time, 1900, yes. Yeah, and as, as my report mentioned, it wasn't very good. <laughs> no, over here? Is there some sort of security system uh, so it can't be contaminated? The state of the art has changed a great deal over the years. I, I'm really not prepared to, to address that question, but I want to believe that they do have lots of uh, uh, checks and balances. The water today is is uh, purified using an ozone process, correct, Joe? Yes. And that takes place up in Marlboro? Yeah. The water, water coming? It takes place at Walnut Hill. It's right where <coughs> Marlboro, North Provo, and South Provo. Join and they ozonate, they use UV light, and then they chloramine. Okay. So the chloramine is a secondary to put a chlorine residual in all the miles of pipe. Okay. So the ozone. And, and that's way back at the beginning of the system, so that all the pipes downstream from that are decontaminated by the 
the ingredients that go into the water in Marlboro. Correct. Sheila? And the water we are actually drinking comes from Quabbin. Yes, and these are... There are aqueducts that link Quabbin to Wachusett, to Fayville, to us, and to Boston. <laughs> but we're not actually drinking the water that's in our reservoirs here. No. No, these three these three reservoirs that I described in the beginning, I believe, are all decommissioned now. Although Basin Three is a reserve, and it's kept in good condition. Yep. So you talk about the all the beautiful architecture that we have around the city. Um, so some of them are pumping stations, and some of these called gatehouses. So what is a gatehouse? A gatehouse controls the flow of water in the in the aqueduct. They may want to increase or decrease the flow depending on, on their needs. Yes. It's on the gravity aqueducts. Thank can you, I, Joe. Can I see this for a second? Yep. So last year, uh, we were desperately seeking houses for the house tour, and I went down to the gatehouse on, um, I guess, Basin 3, the one that we all see on Route 9. And um, I was thinking, wow, this would be so cool to be able to come into one of these gate houses for the house tour. And um, I actually, thanks to the MWRA, they let me in, and it was like, there's no way. But you know, it was just, it wasn't very beautiful inside. It was very utilitarian. But I'll tell you, the view from that, it was just, it was, it was beautiful. So, but yeah, I mean, they're, they're, they're like cylinders that go up and down and control the flow of the um, oh, yeah. res. And it's, it's, is it it's manual or is I think it's done by uh, electronic, is it? Oh, it's both. At the actual gatehouses, I don't think there's any machinery. There's machinery, but I, don't, I think. Well, it's just, gate, it's just machinery to open and close right, gates. Right. But if you go to one of the pumping stations, uh, <laughs> going back to my days at Spot Pond. <laughs> Going back to my days at Spot Pond, um, there's a pump, there's a pumping station there, and it's just so impressive. You know, there's these, it's a huge steam engine really that drives a huge uh, wheel that drives a piston that forces the water around wherever it is that the state wants it to go. I mean, these pumping stations are impressive pieces of machinery, right, Joe? Yes. Go to the Waterworks Museum at Chestnut Hill. You'll see three fantastic, not operable, but three fantastic They're cool. steam engine pumps. Yeah. Uh, yes. I have a book lately, but I think on top of the waterfall there were like little gates that moved so that they could block the water and keep it open up. So they can make small adjustments to the level of the water by putting in water boards. Right. Yeah. Okay, just to be on top of that waterfall. Okay. Yeah, so they had a couple of uh, avenues of getting water into uh, Boston. So the recent eruption they had, which is towards the West End, and they actually reactivated uh, the reservoir number three. It's about 10 years ago. And oh, they yeah. The, uh, Remember that? Sunday yeah. River Aqueduct to bring the water into the south of Boston. And that's that's how they managed to bypass the rupture and uh, keep Boston working. Interesting. One more, maybe? Back here. Okay. Uh, if anybody's got an afternoon or whatever, the MWRA has a terrific historic uh, history of the whole uh, system. So just MWRA.com, you go in there and look at history. You'll spend an afternoon meeting. It is really fantastic. You learn a lot. So the other thing is I just want to do a shout out. We have collected a ton of research. Um, we have the maps of the individual land takings, and thanks to the um, the help over here from the MWRA, et cetera, and the DCR. So we're creating a new special collection on reservoirs and land taking. But anyway, all the research that Fred and Ruthann and others have done is, is going to be available over at the um, Academy in our special collections. And um, let's just Okay, Fred's here for questions, but thank you so much again.